I'm Micah Clark with the American Family Association of Indiana, and I have with me today a good friend. As, you, as I mentioned last week, we're going from a weekly video about the legislature, now that the Indiana General Assembly is over, and we're going to be doing some interviews each week with some friends and people who are experts in their field. And the first person I thought of, someone I admire immensely, he's one of my heroes in Indiana, he's the nation's best, I believe, the best editorial cartoonist when he was a teenager in the mid-70s. He was given his first job in a Danville newspaper, $5 to draw an editorial cartoon. Yeah. And our guest, Gary Varble. Gary, I've wondered, you know, is that even possible today with the way newspapers have changed? But the Lord knew what he was doing with you in a mm. small town paper that opened the door that maybe hasn't even opened today. I can't imagine a little paper even doing that today. But tell us about how that how that opened doors for you. And, and first of all, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Your dear friend, I love you to death. You're, you, I really appreciate the way you you uh, play a role in in the public arena, both through politics and your faith. But but um, tell us about how that those doors were first opened as as a uh, editorial cartoonist. Well, Micah, thank you for having me, and I I really appreciate everything that you do in standing up for family and uh, and I. If people don't follow you on Facebook, they should because you're hilarious. I, I, you, you and Jeff, you post some of the funniest memes, and uh, my wife loves them, and she's constantly talking to me about. It. Have you seen this one? Uh, but and so I got the first time I really got interested in editorial cartoon. Well, cartooning in general was I saw Mad Magazine when I was 12 mm -hmm. years old, and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And in the little town of Danville, Danner's Department Store. Um, I guess it was kind of a five and dime store, but mm -hmm. that was where it began. And then um, I just liked drawing. I would practice doing it on my own. When I got to high school, my freshman year, they had a, a uh, we had a school newspaper. A lot of, a lot of uh, pay, uh, high schools don't have school newspapers anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the, that's where I really cut my teeth in journalism and had a great journalism teacher. And so they had this school newspaper and they had a cartoon contest and I won as a freshman. And so then I became part of the staff. And through that, through that journalism teacher, Nancy Sutton was her name, she connected me with uh, Bob Piercy and Bob Piercy uh, was the publisher of the Danville Gazette. And he invited me uh, when I was, after I graduated, he invited me to be a part of the paper. Just, you know, he said, you know, just do me a cartoon, draw a cartoon. I'll help you get, you know, some issues that we're, we're looking at. And uh, I would draw a cartoon and he'd pay me five bucks. But the main thing was to get published. Mm -hmm. Now that newspaper is not in operation anymore, but their competitor, that little tiny town had two newspapers, uh, two weekly newspapers. And the other paper is called the Republican and it's still in operation. In fact, uh, just starting in January or February, I just started writing a column for them once a month. And so what we, it's me and Philip Gully, who is a pastor, who's a liberal <laughs> pastor. Yes. <laughs> and, and he and I go at each issue. We, we write, I write from the conservative view and he writes from the progressive view. Yeah. And so I've been kind of having fun with that. Um, so, I, you know, I think there are some small newspapers around. A lot of stuff has gone online. If you're a young cartoonist and you really have a passion for it, you know, I think if you're, you know, just did some stuff and just submitted them with no, in, you know, intention of getting paid, just getting published is the main, main thing. I think that that can still happen. In fact, a lot of the cartoonists I talked to, they all started the same way. They got mm -hmm. stuff published in a small weekly newspaper, got themselves established, and then they just kind of grew from there. That was my the beginning of my journey. And I can see now looking back how God just orchestrated all of it. Um, I mean, it wasn't anything special about me. I was pretty rough. Uh, you know, I, my skills weren't there. My mind, you know, I didn't know anything. And, uh, but it seemed like now I can see that the Lord connected me to the right people at the right time and, and led me on the path that I ended up now. Well, for those who don't know, I mean, if I hold up his book, well, he's got several books, but you'll recognize his art style. No doubt. Uh, he's been in the Apple Star for years, and he's online now a lot. And I was wondering, Gary, when when you first started, do you ever go back and have you ever stumbled across your some of your original cartoons and looked at what you are uh, do now and think, wow, is there similarities or, or are there things that, that you see how you've grown in your art? Because one of the things that amazes me about you is 
your artistic ability alone, and I know this is like me talking to a brain surgeon because I'm not artistic, but even without the dialogue side, you have a very unique artistic ability where you don't distort people a great deal. Everyone knows, oh, well, that's the governor or that's so-and-so, and there there are some editorial flares and things, but, but do you look back at your old work and say, wow, I've changed a lot, or you see a lot of similarities? Micah, I was... I was terrible back then. Uh, I'm, surprised. I'm surprised any editor hired me. Uh, yeah, I have grown a lot over the years. I mean, my work has really evolved. I, there's, I think every every person who's an artist has all, all of these other influences, and nobody's an island, and we're all impacted by other people's work. And it's almost like your handwriting over time. You know, it just kind of develops, and and people can recognize it. Uh, that's the way it is with my art style. It's just, and I don't, it's not even th- something I think about. It's just, this is the way I draw mm-hmm. eyes, hands, nose, mouth, you know, cars. And, uh, and, but it's been, it's been a process of being impacted by other people who I admired. You know, my first uh, mentor was Jerry Barnett. Jerry Barnett worked for the Indianapolis News. He's mm-hmm. the editorial cartoonist for years. I met him when I was 17 years old, and he's the reason I became a cartoonist because he encouraged me. He told me, he said that, I think, he said, I think you have what it takes to do this. And he said, you know, you're just going to have to work hard at it. And at that time, uh, 1974 was when I met him, there were 200 jobs in the country for editorial cartoonists. Now to give you some perspective in the year 1900, there were 2000 jobs for editorial cartoonists in the country. And as newspapers started dropping and, and folding, the jobs went away. Uh, the uh, newspaper stopped being the king. It was the king back in the you know turn of the century, mm-hmm. 1900, 20, and 2000. But uh, then it everything started changing. And then um, uh, when we get to like 1957, the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists began, and the purpose was to save cartoonist jobs. Well, let's see how well they did. I left the Indianapolis Star in 2019, took a buyout. And when I left, there were about a dozen cartooning mm-hmm. jobs left in, in the country. There are no cartooning. There's no full-time cartooning jobs in the state of Indiana or the state of Texas. Wow. You know how to pick them, don't you? Ah, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, I was very blessed um, yes. to be able to do it as long as I have. And, and now I have my, you know, I'm self-employed now. I'm set off on my own thing and I do my own newsletter. Uh, interesting thing about the cartooning business itself is that uh, it still has a purpose. It still has an impact, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it was the artwork, you know, Mad Magazine. I loved drawing Mm -hmm. and see if Mm -hmm. I could do it. Then it became the message. Then it became, you know, what can I say with it? You know, that has an impact that, and then it became my, as my faith grew in Christ, mm-hmm. then it became, how can I, you know, I see the world because I've studied the Bible for so long. I see the world through biblical glasses now and through that biblical worldview. Now I know what's right and what's wrong uh, because God said what's right and wrong. And so then I tried to um, basically be his mouthpiece, use the talent that he'd given me to speak to other people. So, more when you, when you first started, was it more the the editor saying, "Hey, I'm writing a, an article, draw a cartoon for this, or draw a cartoon on this subject," or did it start out with Gary? We just need a cartoon, give us something. Uh, you know, th- there was some of that when I was at that small weekly newspaper, but most of the time it was, you know, we have this we have this story coming up. This is what we're doing. Here's what we'd like you to, you know, think about. Uh, The first real full-time job I had at a a newspaper was the County Courier, which was only in operation for one year in Brownsburg, Indiana. And I I had the good fortune of working with Rick Johnson, who had worked at the Star before, and and then he was working for our small newspaper. And he just, he was an idea guy. You know, he'd go out and cover a story and come back and he said, this is what I'm writing on. Here's what I'm thinking. And, you know, I knew nothing. You know, I just... I didn't know politics. I didn't know anything. And so he was just feeding me and then I would draw. And I think in the beginning, that's what it takes. It takes somebody to take, kind of put their arm around you and mm-hmm. kind of lead you. Uh, and so, and I benefited from that. 
Yeah, because then I started seeing, okay, yeah, here's how, here's here's the way you use analogies and 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 metaphors and 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 find you know popular culture and, and use it in a way that we can uh, address certain so, uh, subjects and 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 have a point. That's the main thing, right? You know, Gary, I worked with some. We've done some billboards through AFA before, and I remember a guy telling me who was designing it. If you do more than six or seven words on a billboard, you've lost people. Of course, they're in a yeah. car usually driving by. But yeah. I've noticed you don't use a lot of text usually. I mean, there's certain types of cartoons where you will. But uh, was that something you knew right out of the gate, or was that something you yeah. learned over time? Well, you know, there again, uh, when I, yeah, as a kid, now I'm looking at Mad Magazine, I come across a page and they got all this dialogue. Mm -hmm. I don't even read it. I just look at the cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> look yeah. at the image. I, I love the guys like uh, Sergio Aragones, who was the guy who did these little drawings in the corners, uh, in the margins of yeah. Mad Magazine, because he would tell a story with no words. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is genius. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. But that was one one of the things that really attracted me. So you know, I'm just thinking back, uh, you know, elections past, one of my favorite cartoons with no words was the election with um, John McCain against Barack Obama during the campaign. So I drew John McCain in like a, um, like these mobilized scooters, mm -hmm. uh, mobility mm -hmm. scooter. And then I had Obama in like a tricycle. Yep. And that's all I was saying. This is your choice. Somebody yep. who has no experience and somebody who's really <laughs> On the yep. last song here <laughs> and and it said exactly what i wanted to say and people understood it immediately you don't need words i'm going to show you a cartoon that you'll know immediately this is probably it's hard to say what is my favorite gary varvel cartoon because there's dozens of them you do outstanding work but i remember the first time i saw this i about died um this is the famous mike pence donald trump oh, yeah. cartoon <laughs> And I just thought, because I know Mike, you know Mike, we were friends right. with Mike, and we I felt like, and that I interpreted this as, well, we don't know quite what this Trump guy's like, but we, we know what Mike Pence is like. He'll balance. Right. He's, a, he's a solid Christian believer. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves Mike. This is the the yin and the yang. Hate to say it that way, but it never yeah. it didn't really turn out that way. But the cartoon was was fabulous. Do you, and I guess, yeah. go ahead. Well, this was early in the campaign. Mm -hmm. And of course, Trump is very loud and, you know, he's in your face and criticizing the, you know, his opponents and mocking them. And that's, that was his method. Uh, and Mike is more reserved. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times what was happening early in the campaign was Trump would say something, everybody get outraged. And then Mike Pence would go on TV and he kind of calmed the waters. Yeah. And so yeah. I thought, okay, yeah. I'll just show a big mouth. And then he's standing <laughs> in the mouth trying to, well, what he really meant to say yes. was. Because that's yeah. what he was doing on TV. It was. Today. It was. <laughs> so uh, there's so many great, I'm, I, this is probably like trying to ask you to pick your favorite child. Do you have a favorite cartoon you've done of all time? Well, or two or three? Me, yeah, people ask me all, that, uh, all the time about that. I think the 9-11 cartoon mm -hmm. that I did uh, was... Uh, Uncle Sam carrying the firefighter away from mm -hmm. the rubble in New York. I think that was probably my favorite because it impacted people so much. Uh, mm -hmm. When we first did it, the star printed it into a poster and sold it to raise money for the relief effort in New York. We raised $130,000 on that, on the sale of that cartoon. Mm -hmm. And so that one probably because it, you know, it, it kind of became my identifier. It's in a lot of firehouses, even mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. And so that one was, uh, and then, in 2011, when uh, we, uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed mm -hmm. by uh, uh, Rob O'Neill, we found out later, Navy SEAL, I did a cartoon of just a real tight shot on the left eye yes, of Osama bin Laden. And in the eye, you could see Navy SEAL pointing mm -hmm. a weapon at him, and the pupil was the barrel of the gun. And uh, I think that cartoon was, the, well, that was the year I won the National Headliners Award for editorial cartooning. And I think that cartoon was part of my portfolio. And I think that was uh, because it was different than everyone else's. I think that's why I got the nod. I think I have that in your book here. I've, I've marked yeah, several. Yeah, that's in my book as that's well. That's in the book. Um, so let me ask you, um, 
Yeah. So be yeah. sure and get my book, A Drawing the Right Way. Yes. You can either put, <laughs> you can either uh, go to drawingtherightway.com or you can go to garyvarvel.com and go to my store page and you can buy it there. Excellent. Garyvarvel.com. And you're an ex excellent writer too, Gary. I, I, I read you. your um, email just this morning. That, in fact, I'm going to mention this because I'll get to some of your other cartoons, but we we're talking about when you first started. There's a man named Mike Thompson who is a cartoonist. You wrote yeah. about this in your weekly email. Yeah. And uh, his first cartoon in, in Minneapolis newspaper. And I looked at this cartoon. I thought, this looks like something Gary would do. And and I read it. And, and, and he, <laughs> poor guy does his first cartoon. He gets, the newspaper has to apologize. I, I know this is fuzzy. I'll explain it to you. But there's a picture here. And the caption is of the couple. And the couple simply says, the man's saying, Broadcasting the Muslim call to prayer at all hours will make Minneapolis too noisy. And then outside you have people, uh, thugs, shooting guns all over Minneapolis. Yeah. And I thought, well, this is a, this is the easy cartoon. He's saying if they broadcast prayers, no one will hear it because all the gunfighting yeah. in the street. Somehow people thought this was an anti-Islamic cartoon. I didn't see that at all. No. And the poor guy's first cartoon, the newspaper turns around and apologizes yeah. I'm glad you've got you. You didn't start today when cancel culture is so strong uh, mm -hmm. that you started years ago when you could establish yourself. Because this poor guy, right out of the box, his first cartoon is slammed, and I don't see anything wrong with it at all. I know Mike, and Mike is a, is a friend. We're not close, but I mean, it, we're in a small fraternity of people mm -hmm. who uh, do what we do, and 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 Mark's Mike's pretty far left. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I'm pretty far right, but I still consider him a friend. And we've talked many times on the phone and we haven't talked since this happened. I just found out about this yesterday, but uh, it's heartbreaking because here's what I, I say in my column. Here's what used to happen. Editors would defend it. If mm -hmm. they OK the cartoon, mm -hmm. they print it. If somebody up, gets upset, they defended it. That's mm -hmm. the way it used to be all through mm -hmm. the 90s and the early 2000s. Something happened around 2010. And editors have no courage. Uh, they, you know, the first time somebody, you know, pitches a fit, then they are falling on, they don't fall on the sword. They throw their cartoonist under the bus. And, and I just, you know, that's just not the way it used to be. And people are, are constantly uh, upset. There are some people who are just perpetually right. upset right. about that. And you just can't, the best way to deal with them is you just ignore them mm -hmm. or you just tell them, Hey, write a letter to the editor if you're upset. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the cartoon doesn't mean what you think it means. I got a call one time when I was at the start, this is years ago and I can't remember the cartoon, but somebody was upset and they heard, I said, where did, did you see it? No. I said, well, why are you upset about it if you didn't see it? Well, I heard somebody on the radio talking about it. I said, I, I really encourage you to go get the newspaper and look at the cartoon because it's not what you're saying it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so some people, their perception is, uh, you know, they have there's certain hot buttons that you cannot ever come close to criticizing. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm talking about the death of humor in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in this generation, the death of humor. People have lost a sense of humor and also people are so thin skinned. Mm -hmm. I, it, it just drives me crazy because it makes it difficult when you have to second guess all the time. Well, are, are people going to take this the wrong way? See, mm -hmm. this is another problem with uh, that. Uh, not a problem, but a challenge for cartoonists, because I know what's in my head. I know what I want to say. Now I'm trying to communicate to you through a picture. Mm hmm. And you, it, you may not understand, you know, I'm doing my best to try to get across what I'm saying, but you may see something I didn't even intend. And that happens all the time. That happens with me all the time. Sure. Um, you have a series. I mean, you've always been known, well, for a long time, for as long as I've known you, around Easter to do an Easter cartoon in, in the Annapa Star and other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, here's the uh, here's that cartoon he was mentioning. It's one of his... Oh, yeah favorites of the Osama bin Laden, but one of my favorites, and, and, and uh, you've done a, ver a couple of variations. I remember the first time I saw it was the multi-panel cartoon of Mary Had a Little Lamb at Easter time. Yeah. And um, I've also really enjoyed, I said, flipping through, uh, you did a, you did one of these where people, I don't know if you've ever got pushback on this, but you did one there when, when President Bush passed away. You did yeah. one similar to this with Rush 
Limbaugh returning his golden microphone. Right. Um, you've done uh, from the young man who was a Purdue fan. Uh, I can't think of his yeah. name, uh, but you've done a series like that. I'm just curious. Have you have have you gotten more heat from your religious cartoons or more respect from your religious cartoons? Do you know? Probably more respect. Uh, at, at, at least it's been this way from the time I was working in the newspaper business until now that um, I think people who didn't like it were afraid to say anything. Uh-huh. Now they would be more bold in saying uh-huh. something. That, uh, I got some, I do uh, a cartoon for uh, a publication, not a publication, but it's a newsletter called Counterpoint. Okay. And it's leftist cartoonists with against right cartoonists and we go at it and it's just two a day uh we and i did a christmas cartoon and and one of the cartoonists on the left didn't think it was appropriate because it wasn't an editorial cartoon it was just a religious cartoon and so we went back and forth i just i just this is what i said this is the cartoon i drew i'm not drawing another one this is it yep but you know i for so many years i worked for a secular newspaper meaning you know, godless newspaper. They don't, they don't proselytize. That was not my job, but we have Christian holidays. What are you going to do with that? Right. And so I would say what the Christian holiday was. And I was inspired by Vaughn Shoemaker, who was a two-time Pulitzer prize winning editorial cartoonist, where I think it was a Chicago sun a long time ago, back in the thirties and forties, he was a Christian and he would do, you know, on Christmas, he would do a Christmas mm-hmm. cartoon. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, you know, what are you going to say? So I, it began as a tradition when Gannett bought us, I had already established this tradition every Christmas, I would do a Christmas cartoon, you know, and so it, it, no one said don't do it, I just kept doing them. And I don't know if they didn't like them or not, because I know that, you know, they know that their audience is not, they're not all Christians, but Mm -hmm. the holiday is Christian. Now that, you know, notice though, Mike, people are trying to change the holiday. So it's Mm -hmm. not Christmas, just Mm -hmm. winter celebration or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but I've continued to do that. The uh, Easter cartoon that you mentioned, um, Mary had a little lamb, his mm-hmm. fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb of God would go. He made his way to Calvary to pay for all our sin, and three days later conquered death and rose to life again. And I did that back in the 90s, and I, uh, I then it was just black and white. Then I updated it and made it in color, and, and then uh, I've done that several times since then. Just, you know, just republished. And when I send it to my syndicate, I just say, hey, this is my archive cartoon from for Easter. And if a newspaper editor hasn't used it before, they might want to use it again or use it for the first time. Well, one of the things I appreciate about you is, Gary, you do such a great job showing your faith. You do a great job in, in political cartoons, too, in humor. You're not nasty. I mean, sometimes the editorial cartoonists can get a little, I think, edgy. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always appreciated, I think you present yourself well as a, as a believer and as a conservative, but I wanted to tell you too, um, you know, as, as working in the Indiana General Assembly as a lobbyist with first the Indiana Family Institute for 10 years, and then now 20 years with the American Family Association, that there have been some pivotal moments in the legislature where a cartoon came out from you and, and had a big impact. Um, and of course I tried to fuel that along by passing it around, <laughs> But a couple of cartoons maybe you can comment on going backwards from 22, just last year, February 22. And I'll have Jeff put this up, but it's a cartoon of a girl saying it's not fair. The only biological, only biological boys made the girls team. And we'll put this up, but this is what I'm looking at for your refresher. Um, it's about the Fairness in Girls Sports Act, and which said that only biological girls can play in biological in girls mm-hmm. sports. We don't want guys, you know, competing, it's not fair. Um, that had a big impact at the state house. That cartoon, um, I, I know it, it kind of put the debate into just a small compact package. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's two others I want to mention too, but, but did you ever get feedback from legislators or political p- people in the political process about your cartoons or was no, it mostly very, just readers? Very rarely, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because when you said that, I didn't know that it, it met, had an impact. And for years and years, you know, my job was I go to work and I was in an office, I draw a cartoon, mm-hmm. I go home and I come back the next day and do the same thing. And I would hear occasionally from a reader who was upset about something. And occasionally I hear from somebody who really liked what I do. 
but um, very rarely over the years did I hear from legislators. And so okay. I, I never really knew until after, you know, after I left the star, uh, I had breakfast with a, a, a guy who was involved in politics. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he, he told me, he said, uh, you don't realize the impact that you had over there. He said, people would say, you know, have you seen Varvel today? Mm-hmm. You know? And mm-hmm. they would talk about you. And I had no clue. I, I didn't, I never knew that to me, I was just doing my thing. And I just, and, um, and I didn't, I didn't really know, um, that it was changing anybody's minds or influencing them or, well, one of the cartoons, I, I know it did because this came at a pivotal moment. And I thought for sure Gary's watching what's going on at the State House. This is from February of 19, 2019. And we were debating the issue of hate crimes, which I have issues with that whole theory. I mean, there's no such thing as a love crime. Um, you know, the heart is desperately right. wicked. Who can know it? Uh, people don't commit crimes out of the goodness of their heart. But um, a hate crime is a very politicized uh, concept to start with. Um, But you did a cartoon of Moses handing down the Ten Commandments to the governor Holcomb. And he's saying he forgot one. Thou shalt not commit hate crimes against government approved list of victims. And that was the epiphany of that whole debate is certain people. If you you beat up a grandmother who's 80 years years old, that's an assault. But if you assault a 30-year-old healthy man who happens to be a homosexual, well, that's a way worse crime. And that's yeah. not a way, you know, assault is assault. And um, that kind of got to the crux of we have special victims and we have regular victims and we're supposed to have equal justice under the law. And that cartoon, I sent that to a lot of legislators. I think it had a big impact over there. And we actually did get a law through, I think, that was fair and balanced, applied mm-hmm. to everybody, not just special groups. Um, and that was a battle we fought for years. But that cartoon was hugely influential all over there. So. Mm. Well, that's nice to know. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those cartoons I'd forgotten about. Uh, you know, it's a couple of years ago, and uh, you know, I one of the things I do, Micah, today is I, I do a lot of public speaking, and I've been mm-hmm. asked to speak a lot of different Lincoln Day dinners around Indiana, and, and there was one in Ohio a year ago, and I enjoy doing that. I don't pull any punches though with them. Mm-hmm. You know, I show them, I, I give them some red meat. Obviously, they're going to want me to make yeah. fun of the other side, but. I also show them cartoons that I think the governor was wrong on. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, look, you're just going to ask, <laughs> have to bear with me mm-hmm. here, but this is what I think. And, mm-hmm. uh, and people, they receive it, yep. you know. Yeah. One I of the cartoons they, I, I pulled was actually of an elephant. Republicans were moving money from the back of a taxpayer's pocket. It said, I have a plan to fix roads. This came out. Yes in 2017 <laughs> and the taxpayer's like why well, <laughs> he looks like he's being mugged which is yeah. kind of the the point that right. um the, the republican legislators had a plan to raise taxes on on gas and yet look at the way our roads are and we didn't consent to that so. no no and they keep yeah. they keep raising the gas yeah. tax and it's yep. driving me crazy Me too. well you know you mentioned earlier that i i do cartoons that are not mean or you know um i try to i was inspired by jeff mcnelly jeff mcnelly is a three-time pulitzer prize winning editorial cartoonist he passed away in 2000 of uh cancer but uh and he his work really impacted me when i was in, back in the uh late 70s early 80s uh i would just i admired his work and and not just his drawing style which was very whimsical but uh also the way he conveyed a message because he would do it in and his cartoons were strong but at the same well he won the pulitzer three times that was back when conservatives would actually win a pulitzer that doesn't happen (laughs) anymore (laughs) so um yeah um i'm gonna wind down but i know you you write a weekly email um and you write columns that are excellent and and as well as your cartoons which are included in the email how do people sign up for that and i think it's a is a subscription service you do yeah so uh i i'm writing for substack uh now so i have a substack page and go to garyvarvel.substack.com you can uh subscribe for free you just put your email in and, and say you want the free version and you'll get my stuff. I'll just email it to you. Also, the nice thing about Substack is you can go to the Substack page, my page, and you can see my past 
uh, emails. Uh, you can go and look at them. And, um, or you could go to GaryVarvel.com. You could sign up there. And then both, both of those places have um, uh, where you can sign up, you can pay. If you get the pay version, you get a little more stuff. And so I encourage people. That's one of the ways that the Lord is providing for me now, because mm-hmm. there have been a lot of gracious people who want to help me continue doing what I'm doing. And so I write. The writing thing is interesting because a year before I left the Star, uh, my editor, Tim Swearens, uh, he mm-hmm. came to me and said, look, um, um, we don't have a conservative columnist and we don't, we can't afford to hire one. And he said, would you be willing to write a column? Now, I hadn't written consistently since I was in high school, seriously. And so it'd been a long time. And he he said now here and he, this is what he encouraged me because Tim's a Christian. And he said, mm-hmm. here's what would make you different right from your faith point of view. Well, there's a lot of conservative car columnists out there, but right from the, so the very first piece that I wrote was after that Las Vegas shooter where he, he shot and killed, I don't know, 60 people or something mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. like a sniper. And I wrote a, a column on gun control mm-hmm. and I wrote it from a biblical perspective. And I, mm-hmm. and I think I titled it, the Las Vegas shooter had a heart problem. Mm-hmm. That's why he did this. I remember that. And, and that column, that's my first one. I, I sent it to my editor and I said, I don't know if this is any good or not. You know, you don't have to run it. It's just my trial run. And he put, he put it online within like 20 minutes. It got picked up by Real Clear Politics, USA Today. It was seen by millions. And that, you know, so that gave me confidence. Okay, I guess I have something to say mm-hmm. here too. Writing is so different than cartooning. Cartooning, you're you got it's almost like you're you've developed a bomb and you're gonna just drop this one bomb. But with writing, you have a lot of bullets. The mm-hmm. word of bullets, and you're just you're trying to make your case, make your argument, and and you gotta do it in six hundred, seven hundred words, you know. And so it I like doing both. I didn't know that I would like writing as much as I did. Uh, until I started doing it weekly. And so when I left and I talked with Jeff Howell about, you know, my, I'm going to do this newsletter and he helped me with that, how to set it up. And the writing thing became more popular thing because I started getting feedback when I would write about something, people would write me back and say, you're a good cartoonist. I really love your writing. Uh And so that encouraged me to continue doing that. And so I, I'm, I'm fat. I'm interested in like, um, a prophecy. And so Mm -hmm. I write some from that perspective. I'm also, I love America. And so I write about Mm -hmm. America from the perspective of this is what the founder set up. And I wrote a series of columns about, um, you know, people say what happened to America is not the same place I grew up in. Well, I know, I know what happened Mm -hmm. to America. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, um, about what happened and I go back I, I, I wrote a column a year ago, a series of columns a year ago, based on a book by Dave Brees called Seven Men Who Ruled the World from the Grave. I've heard of that, yeah. And fascinating book. And I what I did was I, I gave him full credit, but I just updated it. You know, there are things that have happened since he died in like 2003 that he would not have, you know, uh, even mm-hmm. uh, had imagined. But, you know, the, the seven men are... Uh, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, uh, John Dewey, who ruined the school system, Mm -hmm. uh, John Wellhausen, Julius Wellhausen, John Maynard Keynes, Soren Kierkegaard. Okay. So those guys all were born in the 1800s. They've been dead a long time, but their philosophies, they wrote a lot, and their philosophies have now been taught in colleges. And they have... Basically, when you implement their ideas into society, they have ruined America. Mm -hmm. And when I go out and speak and I talk a little bit about some of this stuff, then I say, you know, in my opinion, the only way to save America is we need to go back to what the founders set up. Mm -hmm. John Adams, for instance, second president of the United States, said that our Constitution is made for a religious and and, and moral people. It's wholly inadequate for the government of any other. I think he's absolutely right. The reason we have so much crime, and if you watch Twitter right now, it's so full of this person beating up this person or Mm -hmm. this person stabbing another person or someone shooting someone. And it's 
constant violence. We're living in the days of Noah. And that's what yep. Jesus said before yep. he comes back. It would be like the days of Noah. And I, I see it all around me. So that's the kind of stuff I write about. If you want to, if you're interested in seeing more, go to GaryVarvel.com or go to GaryVarvel.substack.com. Sign up. Well, one of the founders, you know, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a yes. Christian conservative, great writer, sire of the declaration, made a simple comedy. He said, liberty without virtue would be no blessing to us at all. Yeah. And that's where we are. We have freedom, yeah. but we have no morals. Exactly. And, and that's why what we have is anarchy. That leads to anarchy. And that's where we're headed. Right. That's so. right. And I used to quote from him in my newsletter just today uh, about schools. And he said, well, the Bible, when it's not read mm -hmm. in schools, are rarely read any other time. And that's mm -hmm. the only thing that can give make people happy, yeah. give them purpose in life. There was a, one of my favorites, and I don't know anything about this guy, and we're going to wrap it up because I'm getting the signal. But okay. uh, there was a Speaker of the House, I think his name was Winthrop, from the mid-1800s, gave a speech, and he said, man will either be governed by the Ten Commandments yeah. or by the Ten Thousand Commandments. And that's where we are. If we don't have internal restraints, which is why libertarianism won't work because we don't have the moral capacity for it. Yeah. Um, but if we don't have moral restraint – it doesn't matter how many laws we pass. We're not, you're, we're going to be. You're talking about Robert Winthrop, who's yes. the speaker of the house. Yes. Robert Winthrop said that, yeah, there's only two ways to control mankind, either with the Bible or, the or with the Yep. Yep. You either control people with, through their heart, or you mm -hmm. have to have a police force that controls them. Mm -hmm. And yep. the second's not very good. Hey, I just want to point out right behind me here is uh, my family yes. tree. I actually yes. painted tree on the wall and then these are photographs of my whole family well, you, my wife and i down at this end and on and you have a pretty fa famous family son that you work with quite a bit too tell us for, as we wrap up tell us about the film projects you guys are doing with so brett. i'm i'm the chairman of the board of house of grace film started by my son brett brett is an actor director producer editor he does it all and he has a production company house of grace studios but his acting career started taking off. He was in uh, American Underdog, uh, mm -hmm. the Kurt Warner story. He was in mm -hmm. uh, Running the Bases. He was lead actor in that Running the Bases. Okay. was in the theaters for a while. Um, he, we just finished shooting a movie in um, the fall of last year called Disciples in the Moonlight. It's in post-production right now. Okay. We're hoping to either get it in theaters by the fall or by the spring of 2024. Mm -hmm. Probably be the spring. But... Um, uh, the, our 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 main uh, objective, our uh, our slogan for the company is that we're using the most powerful medium of our mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. to communicate the most powerful message ever told in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Great so the, the, the medium is not good or evil. It's the people who are mm -hmm. using it, the mm -hmm. message being portrayed. And so what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to use the medium. Yeah, Hollywood has captured the hearts of our right. culture they have dictated yep. uh right and wrong yep and people have compromised their their moral standards what we're trying to do is interject back into the go the gospel into it uh brett and i both recognize so we did two movies together the, the board and the mm -hmm. war within since then he, he is gone on to do, do a whole bunch of stuff without me that's fine <laughs> you know he's on his journey and i'm i'm just here to support him i must become lesser he becomes greater to uh <laughs> but it's all to portray uh the message of jesus christ to people because the gospel is the power of god for the salvation of everyone who believes it's not filmmaking right. it's not us that's just the the um the uh, plumbing system to get it to people but uh, we have heard, you know, in the movies that we've done, we've heard from people, and this is the most rewarding thing for me, Micah, we've heard from people who say, uh, I'll never meet you on earth, but I look forward to meeting you in heaven because oh. I will be there because of your film. Yep, yep. Uh, because the gospel was in the film and that's what impacted them. And so uh, that's why we do what we do. And, um, I, and I'm encouraged because all of our, my, I, my kids, are all walking with the Lord and they're all doing ministry kind of things. So they're using the, the gifts that God gave them mm -hmm. for him. And um, as a father, there can't be more joy right. than that. Yeah. There's a Bible verse that says that too. I yeah. have no greater joy yeah, than that my kids walk with the Lord. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a, I'll close with Gary, but I have a friend who's a very good friend at my church who went to a art and film school and he makes a statement. He said that, uh, uh, 
a movie is always somebody's sermon. Yeah. So whoever made the movie, I mean, the, even the placement of where what kind of brands of cereal are on the countertop when you see a kitchen scene, That's it's right. somebody. It's it's very influential. Uh, somebody has a message, whether they realize it or not. They, more often, they do realize it in mm-hmm. Hollywood, and they push things and they promote things. There's they they have editors for a reason. But yeah. uh, and they wouldn't do that if they didn't know how powerful it was. I mean, people wouldn't spend millions of dollars for a sixty-second right. Super Bowl commercial if mm-hmm. if that didn't influence our behavior. And so, the eye yes. is the window to the heart. And, and so, I'm I'm glad you're in that arena because more Christians need to be out there doing that. So, you know, Brad has told me that a lot of the movies that, like for instance, Netflix uh, mm-hmm. and some of those platforms now, those streaming platforms, they spend a lot of money to get stuff made. They never make the money back. But that's not the goal. The goal is to move the culture. Right. The goal is to change the way people think. And you think about, you know, like my um, my grandkids, for instance, are growing up in an America where traditional marriage. Yeah. Barely you know, even on the screen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So anything goes now. So yeah. once my generation dies off, what are we leaving behind? Right. And, you know, if we're not training our children what God expects, you know, what God's standard is, uh, but we are living in a country that's forgotten God. Yep. And so I'm trying, you know, I feel like I'm with a squirt gun trying to put out a fire, but that, <laughs> I know I that feeling. <laughs> and you do too, Mike. Yeah. And that's why yeah. I so much appreciate you yeah. and your ministry. And- I so appreciate it. It's good to see your face. Uh, you've been a friend for years. I'm glad you're on with us and uh, give us the website one more time. Uh, is it GaryVarvel.com or Gary Varvel? GaryVarvel.com. If okay. you want to just in in if you, GaryVarvel.com, you can see some video okay. stuff that I've done. We'll in the put past, that at the bottom of the screen the too. Score page, yeah, yeah, great. Good, good to see you, and thank you for joining thank us you. today. Thank you for your time, and uh, hope you'll join us back next week when we will have more of this interview, and then uh, the following week we'll have more guests. So, th- Gary, thank you for joining us. God bless you. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.